Hello, you're watching Eye on Africa. I'm James Creedon. Here are our headlines this Thursday evening. Nearly 60 million people are internally, internally di displaced worldwide. That's according to the latest data uh, from the uh, IDMC, the Internal Dipl Displacement Monitoring Centre. We'll be bringing you uh, details from that uh, at the top of the show. Healthcare workers in Zimbabwe are leaving in droves for far better paid jobs overseas. Our reporters have been looking at how the healthcare service is coping with major personnel shortages. And Dakar, the Senegalese capital, it's ground zero right now for arts and crafts from across the continent and indeed uh, the African diaspora worldwide. It's the Dakar Art Biennale. We'll bring you a flavour uh, later on in the bulletin. Thank you for watching. Now, the number of people living in internal displacement around the world reached a record 59.1 million at the end of 2021. That's up from 55 million a year earlier. These are the findings of data released uh, by the, the Geneva-based Internal Displacement Monitoring Centre. Uh, many African countries uh, affected by that, of course. And we're going to devote the top of tonight's show to that very topic. We're joined now by Alexandra Bilac, uh, director of the IMDC and lead author of uh, this report on uh, internal displacement. Thank you for talking to us this evening. Uh, from uh, Geneva. First off, mm -hmm. tell us uh, just about uh, the starkness of these figures, uh, the seriousness of these of this data. It's it's at a, an all time high, as far as I understand. Give us a sense of the global findings of this report first, before we get to uh, the report as it applies to Africa. Thanks indeed, um, and good evening. Uh, as you said, our new report shows that uh, there are now 59.1 million people living in internal displacement across the world, uh, which is double what their number was 10 years ago. 90% uh, of the world's IDPs have been displaced by conflict, uh, and the majority in Africa and in the Middle East. Uh, Syria, the DRC, Afghanistan, Yemen and Colombia are home to the largest numbers of internally displaced people. And of course, since February this year, we also need to now include, sadly, Ukraine to this list, with already more than 8 million people internally displaced there. Um, so what the report shows is that today people are fleeing a, a very complex mix of factors, uh, political ones primarily, but also environmental, uh, social and economic ones. Uh, we see across the world and, and in Africa in particular how conflicts are combining with climate-related disasters and how um, the COVID-19 pandemic and now the war in Ukraine have added new layers to these, uh, to these crises and created uh, very intractable situations that are likely to have, uh, we believe, profound effects for the generations to come. Are the, uh, is the data of internally displaced people, is it directly linked and uh, very analogous to broader migration uh, data? I mean, certainly if you look at certain zones in, for example, the Sahel region, these are cross-border issues. What would you say to that? Mm -hmm. your, your report focuses specifically on internal displacement, but I guess it can't really be dissociated from, dissociated from the broader trends nowadays, right? No, absolutely. And, and, uh, and what we can see is that there's a clear correlation oftentimes between internal displacement and cross-border movements. If you take countries like Ukraine or, or Syria uh, in the last few years, uh, a, a displacement crisis often starts at home. People start uh, fleeing to other parts of the country before they eventually uh, decide to cross a border. So there's a, there's a clear interconnection. Um, but the data is, uh, is quite separate. We have d different data sets for IDPs, refugees, refugees and, and migrants. Uh, and it's still important to keep those distinctions as, as they, uh, they reflect different realities on the ground and, uh, and also point to different uh, responses that are needed. OK, let's talk about sub-Saharan Africa. Let's talk about the Sahel region. Uh, let's talk yeah. about drought and famine, because, of course, there's war, but also these, you know, other issues. Give us a, a snapshot of what we're dealing with right mm. now, because it, it's, it's pretty bad. It is. So in, in 2021 alone, we recorded 14 million displacements or movements that were linked to conflict and violence. Now, 80% of these movements happened in Africa. Uh, so if you think about, uh, for example, the crisis in, uh, in northern Ethiopia or even the DRC, which, uh, which together those two countries um, account for most of these, these movements, but also uh, new waves of violence in Burkina Faso, in Mali, Sudan, the Central African Republic, which have pushed people to seek refuge 
uh, in other parts of their country as they've tried to escape this uh, often intercommunal violence or attacks that are, create, uh, that are committed by non-state armed groups. So in a lot of cases, these new waves of violence are, are just fueling already existing and, and very protracted crises. If you think about the DRC, it's a protracted crisis that has been ongoing now for, for decades. Uh, and these are adding to the needs of people uh, who are now becoming displaced repeatedly and oftentimes with very little humanitarian assistance. Um, and so then besides the, the, the conflict, uh, we're also seeing that disasters are causing uh, huge numbers of movements globally with 23.7 million in 2021, but also in, in Africa. We see weather-related hazards like, like storms and floods um, that typically account each year for the majority of these displacements, but now also droughts. And as we saw so last year, uh, even geophysical hazards uh, causing oh. displacement. OK, Alexandra, with the very little time we have left, if you were to yeah. give two or three uh, takeaways from this report that, that could sort yeah. of point things in the right direction for humanity. I mean, I guess with so much data collected, the hope is, mm -hmm. too, that we could take lessons away from, from all of this. Can you think of a couple of things that might, uh, some good that might come out of this report, some, mm -hmm. some useful, um, I suppose, takeaways where, where we could yeah. kind of put that data to useful um, ends, if you like? Well, I think bef before even just getting to the good, maybe just one uh, key takeaway is to just acknowledge now that uh, these displacement crises are no longer uh, monocausal in a mm. sense. They're not purely connected to either conflict or environmental change or, or disasters. They are, they're, they are very much uh, uh, multifaceted. And what we're seeing in sub-Saharan Africa in particular now with drought and food insecurity pushing people's in, people into displacement and combining with the conflict, it, it's clear that we need to look at these crises as a uh, as, as as, as development challenges, as political challenges, humanitarian assistance alone is no longer enough, mm. which is why we're now looking at what governments are doing across the world in partnership with the, with the international community, of course, to adapt to the challenge by better connecting humanitarian peace building and sustainable So, so might, I, might I conclude that because it's a focus on internal displacement, that really there's a focus on how governments can respond as opposed to broader international organisation or humanitarian uh, issues Absolutely. related to cross-border migration. So how governments Absolutely. can the deal with these challenges. Mm. Yes, absolutely. The primary responsibility, of course, rests with governments. And we're, we are encouraged to see that more and more governments now are taking this issue extremely seriously and are recognizing all these interconnections and that it is in their national interest to act on it. And there are a lot of promising uh, practices and approaches that we've highlighted in the report and that we believe could be scaled up and replicated across uh, across the region and, and the rest of the world. OK, well, well done on your on your um, important work and hopefully some good will come out of it. Thank you for that, Alexandra Bilak, Director of Thank the you very much. Internal Displacement Monitoring Centre in Geneva. Thank you. Low salaries and poor working conditions are driving Zimbabwean healthcare workers to leave the country. Uh, indeed, uh, the draw to foreign shores can be very attractive. Some European countries pay up to 10 times their average salary on a monthly uh, basis. But those remaining in Zimbabwe are left coping due to understaffing as a result. Still wearing her scrubs after a 12-hour hospital shift, Virginia Mutsamwira immediately begins her second job. The senior nurse runs a small grocery store out of her home, a necessary income boost for the 52-year-old who earns less than $200 a month at the hospital. With the amount of uh, remuneration I'm getting right now, I don't see myself having a comfortable retirement. Too many patients for not enough personnel, under-equipped facilities and miserable salaries, a reality that affects nearly all healthcare workers in Zimbabwe. The country's health system has been crumbling for over a decade and was sent tumbling by the COVID-19 pandemic. As a result, health workers are increasingly looking for work opportunities abroad. Last year, some 1,800 nurses left to work in the UK, around 10% of Zimbabwe's total workforce a mass exodus that makes life even more difficult for those who stay behind. We have been out. That's all I can say. It's tearing. The nespation ratio is, uh, is really bad. Hoping to fill the staffing gaps, Zimbabwe's government recently began rehiring retired healthcare workers and expanding medical training. But critics say the only way to stop the brain drain is to fix the country's broken health system.
Now, Dakar's Biennale of Contemporary African Art opened on Thursday afternoon. Artists from more than 80 countries have descended on the Senegalese capital. It's one of the annual events bringing together Africans from across the continent with members of the African diaspora elsewhere in the world. Sarah Sacco and Sam Bradpriest uh, bring you this report. The final touches are being made before the grand opening. 59 artists will exhibit here in the main venue in the old high court of Dakar. Cameroonian artist Hako Hansen explores the role of ancestral rights in contemporary Africa. Fali Sen Sao from Senegal projects a dystopian future through his work. And Victor Sona has come all the way from the Netherlands to delve into the theme of pluralistic identity. Because every story has two sides, I have to show how the painting was done, as well as what's not seen. Like many artists here, Sona, who was born in Cameroon, normally exhibits in Europe. He is delighted to return to his roots. I like coming to Africa. It's where I find inspiration. It's great to come to Dakar to show my work. What I got out of Africa, I'm now bringing back. The Biennale was first held 30 years ago. Its artistic director says it's an important institution for the promotion of African art. It's a Biennale that focuses on the artistic reality of the continent and its diaspora. The priority is to give space to artists from the continent to gain visibility in order to promote creation. Around 2,500 artists will descend on Dakar from now until the end of the festival on June 21st. Beautiful stuff there. That brings us to the end of this edition. Thanks for watching. I am Africa.